On today's World Insight, Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party will elect a new leader following Prime Minister Abe's resignation. Will his successor continue his legacy? And Chinese war epic The 800 becomes the highest grossing movie since the COVID-19 pandemic. An industry insider, co-founder, and CEO of Huayu Brothers tells the story behind the scenes. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. We begin our program in Japan where the race to become the next prime minister is heating up. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe announced last Friday that he is resigning due to health reasons. But he says he plans to stay on until a successor is named. Japan's chief cabinet secretary Yoshihide Suga has tossed his hat into the ring. Suga is seen as a close aide of the now longest serving Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Other contenders are former Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida and the former Defense Minister Shigeru Ishiba. Abe's resignation comes as Japan faces many challenges, such as the coronavirus pandemic, a stagnant economy, and the postponed 2020 Tokyo Olympics. So, what's the impact of his resignation? What are some of the policy that's likely to be continued by the next prime minister? Let's talk to our panelists from Japan and China. For more on the resignation of Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, we are joined by a very strong panel in Tokyo. Naoyuki Yoshino, who is a professor emeritus with Keio University, he himself is an economist. In Hong Kong, we have uh, Kato Yoshikatsu, adjunct associate professor with Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong. In Beijing, via Skype, Jia Daojun, professor from the School of International Studies at Peking University. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. The biggest news, of course, over the weekend, this is resignation of Japanese prime minister. But as far as we know, Mr. Kato, this is not the first time. We have known, you know, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has had medical issues over more than decades. But maybe, you know, he, he accumulated his fatigue because, you know, facing the coronavirus or, you know, uh, postpone of the Tokyo Olympics. So maybe, you know, he's been very tired and, you know, he may finally made the decision to resign. Uh, this is something surprising, but you know, uh, not beyond our expectation. Mm. We haven't known yet who is likely to be the most uh, strong candidates, uh, do we, uh, Mr. Yoshino? Uh, likely September the 14th, uh, uh, the LDP is going to make a decision. Yes, uh, we have not known who will be the successor. However, Abenomics has lots of uh, uh, issues to be remained. Prime Minister Abe was successful in monetary policy and monetary easing. Mm -hmm. However, fiscal consolidation and structural reforms are still remain. So that successor of Prime Minister Abe has to do lots of reforms in economic policies. Uh, Professor Jia, on Monday, the Japanese Prime Minister was reportedly already on the phone with the U.S. President uh, Donald Trump, uh, uh, how do you see from uh, Beijing uh, the latest uh, development? Well, Mr. Abe uh, is one of the few Northeast Asian uh, leaders who has fairly extensive business background. He speaks English, and uh, Japan and the U.S. being uh, strategic allies, it's uh, not a surprise that uh, they make a phone call and. Um, they uh, normally, when such changes of leadership happen, uh, it's probably a courtesy call. But uh, you know, we are at the mercy of uh, press release by both the Japanese and American governments. We'll have to wait and see what specific content they discuss. Mm. Now we know that the pandemic situation in Japan is coming in cycles and we are now in the very middle of another cycle which is quite serious. So what about the economic prospect and the possibility of continuation of economics in that regard? Uh, let me talk from my expertise. I think uh, one is Tokyo Olympics because you know, Shinzo Abe you know, very regrettably postponed 
the Tokyo Olympics, the second time post uh, Tokyo Olympics, and actually that would create some damage for the Japanese economy, not only you know, uh, substantially, but you know to stimulate and you know pushing forward the Japanese mentality to integrate uh, the potentiality of e Japanese economy. This is one thing. And in terms of you know Japan-China relations or external relationship, because Shinzo Abe, as a part of Abenomics, he made a point of inbound. I mean tourism from outside, mm -hmm. and in this sense, the pandemics uh, basically cut down this demands, you know, this you know, internal consumption. So I think you know multilateral you know factors you know combine together and give a damage uh, to uh, Japan's economy. Spending, especially government spending, Professor Jia has been the key uh, message coming from the Abenomics. Uh, but now, how much the government can still spend? I mean, how much can you make the yen cheap? and flow around uh, for investment and how much will the outside uh, so-called uh, inbound tourism and the exports really help Japan as a result of the pandemic these do not know what do you make of the current situation though? Abenomics especially the largeness of stimulus packages or should we say uh, unlimited quantitative easing it's not necessarily unique to Japan a, a bigger threat, I would I wouldn't even call it a worry. I think it's a threat uh, would come fr probably from the United States in response to the uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, the Federal Reserve announced unlimited easing, and then you have uh, consistent, uh, <coughs> persistent free handouts to consumers. Mm. And how this is going to work remains to be seen. Mm. Um, then. Coming back to the Japanese situation, I would think uh, aging and the uh, difficulty of creating new jobs that fit an aging population. On top of that, you have uh, uh, robotics taking over a lot of jobs, mm. and it's a diff very difficult, structurally difficult situation for Japan. And that's right. probably why our earlier commentator emphasized the. Uh, Olympics as a way of boosting um, uh, confidence of the Japanese population and also Olympics as a way of relinking many of uh, the activities between Japan and the rest of the world in, ter in terms of trade and uh, investment. Yeah, of course the Olympic Games, according to the latest news, uh, is still going to continue next year, but uh, if it could be done, would that be a huge boost to the Japanese economy, even given the current situation? If it could not, what would that mean? Will the next Prime Minister's job mainly to maintain that the Olympic Games will be held? Uh, Professor Yoshino. I think Olympic Games could be opened. However, number of visitors will be drastically reduced. Right. So I don't think uh, economic impact will be big. However, it is important for Japan to have Olympic game. So I think it's an announcement effect, not the economic impact. Secondly, I think robotics and other IT technology will help elderly people to keep on working rather than conflicting each other. Mm -hmm. Because elderly people, their muscles will be weaker, then robot will be needed. So I think IT technology and the robot will compensate for those elderly workers, they can come back to our economy. That is a very good positive sign. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, I think Japan needs uh, infrastructure to develop uh, information-oriented industries, including government offices. And that could be very important key issues, how we could incorporate those technological progress especially IT technologies in the jobs. Will this pandemic, in a way, you know, silver lining out of this cloud, uh, in a way, help with the digitization that is going on inside Japan, which has been long time desired, but the pace could be slow earlier? Yes, as you said, it was very slow. However, all my classes were internet, and I have never seen students for one semester, and schools and so on. Then the top teacher can teach the best lecture to all over Japan. That's right. So that will drastically change the level of the education. I think we have to take uh, Pinch's chance. So mm. Japan should promote lots more uh, IT technologies in education. And also people started to work from home rather than commuting. 
and it is very good for ladies. They can take care of their children at home, and still they can work. So mm -hmm. I think it's a very good sign for Japan to recover our slow progress of information technologies. Uh, J Japanese society you know, always tends to be conservative and reluctant to change. But now we are facing a pandemic and plus uh, postponed of Tokyo Olympics. And now I think we should uh, take this uh, crisis uh, into chances to transform our society d uh, drastically and remoting or work from home or you know digitalization information technology and we now we have to face it and we have to transform ourselves to mm -hmm. the next generation so i think it's uh, we should uh, think the current situation strategically uh, professor ja how should we understand the legacy if we can uh, even though premature at this moment to say that about uh, prime minister <coughs> abe uh, particularly regarding foreign policy well, um, Mr. Abe served as, you know, uh, the longest serving uh, Japanese prime minister post war. Um, he presided over a word that was changing, but nevertheless, the driver of the change was probably not so much from Japan, but from uh, the two other ends of the Pacific, namely China and the United States. He representative of uh, politicians his generation. Um, he really, in many ways, the epitome of uh, a generation of leadership in Japan in this regard. We're really coming to an end of a transition of uh, resetting, in some ways, uh, resetting on the foundations of relationship between the two countries. In other words, the histories of uh, war. Uh, are effectively being put aside, uh, then um, we basically, between China and Japan, has a trade and investment uh, based relationship uh, rather than in security cooperation. Mm. Uh, the two countries managed to keep the territorial issue, namely over uh, what we call here in China, Diao Yu, and what they call in Japan, Senkaku Island, in, uh, in check. And on that basis, uh, it's really uh, takes great effort uh, down the road, whoever becomes the new Jap prime minister, to uh, identify a set of foundations for the two countries to move mm -hmm. forward. Earlier, the two Japanese colleagues commented on IT. Um, one of the challenges, as I see it, uh, as a political scientist, is that in many ways, particularly under Prime Minister Abe, um, the Japanese government has been maintaining a steady distancing from China in IT technologies. IT is a, a new industry, but uh, it's a growth industry, but it's very heavily uh, consumer oriented. It does, it does not necessarily um, require high income or anything else. But of course, politics can come in, as we have seen, yeah. in the uh, ban on apps in different societies. So overall, uh, yeah, the, re the relationship will be complicated, but uh, from both sides, uh, both here in China and over there in Japan, we need a lot more effort to re-identify a set of new foundations. Mm. Mr. Kato, following what Professor Jia just said, um, how d did you see Prime Minister Abe being uh, zigzagging his marks and also Japan's role so far in a ever more complicated geopolitics uh, uh, between China and the United States. Uh, where uh, do you think he apparently tries to lead Japan to? Uh, I think in terms of uh, external relations or Japanese foreign policy, uh, actually Japan, uh, Shin Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has contributed a lot and put a great investment on foreign policy. Uh, first of all, Japan, you know, uh, Japan uh, continues to strengthen the relation with the United States. Japan-U.S. alliance has experienced somehow turbulence, maybe it's partly thanks to the President Trump, uh, including the TPP, uh, the, the United States unilaterally withdrew, withdrew from the TPP. It's a very important uh, diplomatic multilateral effort, but the United States withdrew unilaterally. But, you know, Shinzo Abe uh, continues to uh, make it activated, and you know, and as a CPTPP, uh, trying to initiate the lead, uh, open and free and relatively inclusive, high 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 qualities 
uh, multilateralism in this region. So I think this is a great uh, accomplishment for uh, Shinzo Abe. And at the same time, you know, Shinzo Abe tra has tried to manage uh, the relation with China uh, as, as much as he can. So this is a very uh, complicated triangle, you know, Japan, U.S., and China. And this has been the very important challenge for Japanese foreign policy, how to take balance and manage well you know, among this triangle relationship. But Shinzo Abe basically and successfully managed the relation with the United States and with China. Uh, maybe in, when it comes to China, uh, basically you know, uh, promoting the economic ties and some you know, strengthen the international cooperation, including RCEP or you know, uh, joint efforts in the third, uh, third country. Of course, this is just the beginning. But I think this is a great legacy and lesson uh, for us to take uh, since uh, how uh, for Japan, how to uh, simultaneously manage this very complicated and strategic triangle, I mean, Japan, mm. China, and the United States. And in this sense, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe uh, has done something meaningful. You know, one is the biggest market Japan could have in its neighborhood, of course, China, uh, including high-tech products uh, to China, which, of course, started from the very beginning of China's reform and opening up uh, the trade uh, between China and Japan. Uh, but now, uh, if doing that, there might be some problems with Washington. However, if only kowtowing to Washington's uh, prescription of the world map, uh, Japan would also lose a lot. Uh, how to maintain that is a very interesting uh, factor, particularly in the tech sector. Mr. Kato. In terms of uh, technology or high tech, because now it's always combined with the national security issue. So, you know, you know, you know some mm -hmm. check and balance or, you know, observations should be required. Uh, but uh, for Japan, uh, you know, not only uh, diplomatically, but economically, uh, Japan has no way to lose the China's potential huge market. But at the same time, we need to learn how to manage and how to adapt, adjust to the new trend, including what you said, uh, technology, the rise of technology, the rise, rise of high technology. And now a uh, huge and deep skepticism are here, uh, existing uh, in front of us. So you know, how to you know, tackle and how to you know, overcome this kind of vicious cycle and mutual distrust. And mm -hmm. in this sense, uh, Japanese uh, leaders, including Prime Minister's successor, we need to you know, continuously uh, pursue you know, how to deal with China. At the same time, uh, we cannot lose the Japan-U.S. alliance. You know? yeah. So this is the biggest dilemma for Japanese diplomacy. Yeah. Mr. Yoshino, you know, as an economist, the political and geopolitical complex uh, Japan is facing, just like many others are facing today. Mm -hmm. um, Asia's GDP, 1600, was two-thirds of the world. And then after first uh, industrial revolution and so on, Asia's, Asia's share had been diminished. But to, there's expectation again, two-thirds of GDP may be created by Asian nations. So Northeast Asia, South Asia, South Asia, those connectivities are very important. And secondly, we often talk about political relations, but we need three continuous relations, political relation, industrial relation, and people-to-people -people relations. And I think industrial relations, as you mentioned, not only high-tech, but also various part of industrial connections will mm -hmm. be needed within Asia. So that is very important. Thirdly, I think people with people. When we looked at the France and uh, Germany, and they had lots of fighting each other. But I heard high school students started to exchange each other. Some of the students go to Germany. German students went to uh, France. And then gradually, the people by people, their mind became closer and closer. So I think uh, China, Korea, Japan, I think those kind of student exchange, especially using uh, internet, then they don't have to go to each country. But they can start talking each other. Japanese say ni hao, then Chinese say hello, and we can start communicating each other. So I think three levels of connectivities are very important. What is likely to be the quality of the next Prime Minister of Japan? What he or she must have in terms of its quality? And uh, who is that likely to be? Uh, a brief prediction, if you can? I have great confidence in whoever comes in, in many ways, uh, the political structure of Japan that will 
shaped in the 1950s remains strong. The person who is going to lead the LDP and the Japanese government is uh, not going to be as critical. But uh, the challenges like aging, like fiscal consolidation, mm -hmm. like regenerating growth, these are the same. Uh, it will be with Japan for many more years. And uh, the biggest challenge is probably aging. I think he has to have three points. One is domestic economy, fiscal policy, huge deficits, and monetary policy has to be gradually consolidated, so he has to know economics very well. And secondly, uh, he has to friendly with the U.S. and Asia, and he can be the connector between various regions. So politically, he has to be respected, and he has to travel many, many countries to negotiate each other. Mm -hmm. And third one is uh, technological progress. Japan is uh, doing very well, so I think uh, lots of connections can be combined with other nations. Uh, the next prime minister should be strongly committed to political stability and policy continuity. And in this sense, uh, you know, the next prime minister should be, uh, uh, how to say, very uh, deeply understanding uh, what Shinzo Abe could have done and could not have done. Well said. Naoki Yoshino, Yoshikatsu Kato, and Jadaoju. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. And be safe wherever you are. And you're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on the program. Lights, cameras, and action. Cinemas are back in business, at least in China. A lot of them showing the film, the 800. A story behind the scenes and how movie makers are coping amid the pandemic. An industry insider, executive producer of the movie, co-founder and CEO of Huayi Brothers, tells us all. Right Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. And now let's talk about movies, but not just the movies themselves. A war epic is China's first blockbuster since the COVID-19 outbreak. With box office already reaching 300 million U.S. dollars now, the film The 800, produced by the Huayi brothers, is about a battered Chinese army platoon's heroic last stand against the Japanese forces in the 1930s Shanghai during the Second World War. This film won praise from moviegoers and critics alike after its preview screenings began on August 14th, less than a month after Chinese cinemas reopened in July. Will the 800 jumpstart the broader film industry in China? Will that serve an inspiration for the movie industry around the world? Earlier, I sat down with Wang Zhonglei, who is the executive producer of the film and also co-founder and CEO of the film's studio, Huayi Brothers Media. We talked about the stories behind the film, how they achieved a box office miracle, and how movie makers have adapted to the pandemic. Take a look. Mr. Wang, welcome to CGTN. Hi. Congratulations, I should say. $23 million box office just during the weekend for this movie, right out of COVID-19 pandemic. Amazing. Uh, for the 800, I am proud of its success at this special time. Facing the global epidemic after cinemas closed for almost seven months, our film entered the market and we did not have any expectations for the box office. We wanted to see how much buzz it could generate. Under normal circumstances, we compared data from the same period last year and the year before, then make a work plan and expectations. But we could not do the same thing this year. When we set the release schedule, due to epidemic prevention and control reasons, the attendance rate of cinemas cannot exceed 30%.
social distance. Yeah. At that time, only 40 to 50 percent of movie theaters had reopened. Faced with so many challenges, we made the decision to release the 800. Therefore, we had just hoped for the best, but had low expectations. After the box office came out, our company and the whole Chinese film industry were very excited. Not only Chinese movie industry, but also international. I heard IMAX, their stocks raised like 10 to 15 percent just on Monday. It is difficult to change the development of an industry during this special period by just one company. I think the power of unity is in need. Choosing, a, choosing such a schedule for such a movie is a common decision made by many people. We all know that when a market reopens, a strong blockbuster is definitely needed to lead the market. From the Spring Festival to now, we have several good films in stock, and they all have the opportunity to be a vanguard. However, it is not enough for a leading film to have entertainment value. It also needs to have artistic value, such as produced by IMAX technology, and have kind of a spiritual power from the film itself. So finally, we decided to use the 800 to drive the market after the rescreening. Before the release, the box office of all movies in China was only 15 million RMB. We were very nervous at that time. You've been working on this movie for more than four years. Now, at a critical time when the market is not clear as to how much it would be able to bring the attention and the box office, you dare to put it out there. That's amazing to me. We SARS. At the beginning, we did not know what the epidemic would become. I had experienced SARS. It was also a serious epidemic, and I was also making movies at that time. Today, both the public health standard and the national strength have improved. We did not expect the epidemic to last so long. The cinema is the latest of all entertainment and cultural facilities to reopen. Should we release a new movie? I think not only courage is needed, but also confidence is needed. Our confidence came from the quality of the film, the ability of advertising, and the demand of the market. We did a lot of market research before. From March to July, when the slogan of resumption of work was put forward, our market research results changed a lot every month. At the beginning, most people did not want to go to the cinema, zero choice in the research. And gradually, they started to have the urge. In June, the entire entertainment consumer demand placed reopening cinemas third among entertainment options. So our courage came from the market, as the audience was eager to return to the cinema and restore their social life. I understand you are also at this moment very courageous in a way because the movie industry is experiencing the pandemic while at the same time your company is also experiencing some kinds of challenge. So be able to put it out there, put yourself out there, that's also quite something. The 800 has a very simple meaning to me. I have worked in the film industry for almost 30 years, and there may be another 30 years in the future. I am the child of a soldier. I love war movies since I was a child. When I was young, I watched red classics. When I grew up, I also watched war movies from other countries. 
A few years ago, director Guan Hu told me he wanted to film the story of Sihang Warehouse. He told me his thoughts. It must be a film for peace. It must be an anti-war film. It must talk about human nature, such as how people change in four days because of the war. The film also gave me a lot. For example, you believe you have learned a lot by the time you are 50. Like the old saying goes, 50 knows the destiny. But eventually, you find out there are many things you don't know and challenges you cannot face. The epidemic has subverted our perceptions. Should we be weak or strong, evasive or brave? The spirit of the 800 has many similarities with current realities, which encourages us to release such a movie. The investment for it is very large, and the film has been unable to enter the market for nearly one year and a half which pressured us as a listed company, not only from the financial perspective, but also the pressure from the public. All are inevitable. But I did not want to put so much pressure on the film itself. Otherwise, I think it is unfair to it. Like we discussed, do I have expectations? I don't have much hope, but I have expectations. But when the expectations are surpassed, it is a sense of victory. Already feeling the victory is out there. Yeah, I think this victory is no longer measured by the box office. Although the turnout is greater than many initially expected, the global epidemic, limited seats, and restricted sales. There are many uncertainties, but in just four days, a movie brought 35 million people back into the cinema. These audiences also share their movie-going experience. They spontaneously post comments on social platforms, which generate buzz around the movie, and it becomes a trending topic. Some suggest movie is in the hands of the beholder, of the victor. Uh, some others suggest it really depends on how you analyze the history. I don't know to you because you have to make a movie about history. I'm sure you give extra thoughts about that. I think filmmaking is a very special art form. Artists are not historians. Artists are not archaeologists. So I think artists do not have the responsibility to make movies as if they are recording history. Instead, they are turning a piece of history into a movie via cinematic methods. I think all artistic works, be it movies or plays, should have their own attitude towards history. They are completing an artistic creation in the background of history. So about four to five months before we started shooting the 800, I had a small lunch meeting with the head of IMAX in my hotel room. The head of IMAX asked me, do you think we could find ways to cooperate more deeply? I said, we are about to make a film can you give us the technology for us to shoot it in IMAX? It was only about four to five months before principal photography began. We asked the cinematographer and he was totally on board with the idea. He is already a master, so he is hoping to do something different. Then we found two big challenges in shooting in IMAX. First, we don't have many IMAX cameras. Normally for a big production, we use five to ten cameras to shoot a scene, but there is only one IMAX camera at our disposal. So it turns out that we have only one camera for such a big movie. 
The second big challenge is that the resolution of IMAX is simply too high. The image is so clear, and its wide angles are close to what human eyes see. During our trial shooting, we discovered that there can be no error when we shoot people or objects up close. The hardest part is with extras. We used a huge number of extras in this movie. So, we ended up turning all the extras into what we call character actors. For every single one of them, we gave them a backstory and a look. They had purpose in the scene. Unlike before, if their acting was not good, we just cropped the frame and excluded them, but it was no longer possible with IMAX. War movies, war epics are really outstanding, many of them. Uh, I remember right that you were starting your movie career by a war movie with Jiang Wen, and then moving on with Feng Xiaogang, and now another one. I'm sure it in a way reflects personally your own growth as an executive producer. To be honest, I think people are in fact not belligerent. The vast majority of people do not like wars. We all have a pretty good idea of what wars would bring. Wars bring cruelty, destruction, and the reversion of progress. People know this. So this leads us to the question of what role do war movies play? I think war movies play different roles in different times. For the movie The 800, I've been reading reviews of moviegoers, reviews from experts about the movie, and the historical battle depicted in the movie. I have found one common theme in these reviews. That is the role of human beings in wars. We look at wars from the perspective of the people in these wars, because we are all just ordinary people. So, when we look at other ordinary people who are caught in wars, we can sympathize with them. My personal feeling towards the movie The 800 is that the film hit pretty close to home for me. It's a movie the ordinary people can relate to. Many audiences have asked the question of what I would do if I were that person in the movie. Would I lift the gun? Would I make that shot? Would I choose to sacrifice myself to help the battle? Every reviewer said in normal circumstances, no, I would not. But at the same time, many people said, if they were put in that extreme position, in that moment they might have done the same. So I think this is a special thing about war movies. They have this morale-boosting effect on people. It makes people look at death differently. It's no longer a personal demise, but instead it makes you think what your death can accomplish. When you look at death in this way, then it may become almost easy for you to choose to sacrifice yourself. I think it is worth seeing this movie if it gives you this energy. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the movie market here is huge here in China. Everybody wants to be here. So they could be your partners, they could also be your competitors. What do you make of the potential of the Chinese movie industry vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the others' participation? From a strategic planning perspective, it is of course going to be very complicated, but in terms of doing work on the ground, I think we don't need to worry too much about the future. Everything is changing so fast these days, be it the greater economy or our film industry in particular. Like we said earlier, only a few years ago, we didn't think we would promote and market the movie solely via the internet. Ticket sales over the internet and now even meeting the audience is done online. We did a cloud premiere for the first time for this movie. Traditionally, we took the actors around the country to do premieres and promotions. But this time we found that we were able to replace the old ways with a new online way. So you see, we didn't plan this, but it still worked out. So I think we should focus on filmmaking itself. The more grounded we are in our craft, the further we will be able to go. On the contrary, if we spend too much energy predicting the future, it might actually slow you down in the present. You've already laid a great foundation for all the international blockbusters, you know, whether it's Mulan or the Tenet, they're all eager to come into this market and be shown in the theaters. Finally, before we go, I do want to ask you an important question, I think. 
of course, everybody can do a lot of things, can do a lot about art and a lot about business. But it's always interesting at times how much percentage you are the artist and how much percentage you are the business person. To be honest, I have always felt the artist and the businessman do not really contradict each other. If you only pursue art, but you have no means to make it into reality, then something is lacking here. Actually, for my current role, I'm foremost responsible for a publicly listed company. So naturally, I'm more of a businessman at the moment. I find art movies very interesting because they place a strong focus on self-expression. I have recently come to a sudden realization that I don't have to support all art movies. Since art films are about self-expression, so shouldn't my expression of myself also count? So these days when I choose which artistic films to support, I pick the ones that match my taste that speak to me. Why would I produce an art film that I don't even get? That would be forgetting why I chose to do a film in the first place. Also, when you really like a project, you're able to mobilize your energy more completely. So this is the balance I have found. Congratulations once again. Thank you. That's Wang Zhonglei, the executive producer of the latest film, the 800, which already grossed box office of 300 million U.S. dollars so far. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us. World Insight is the name of our program. You can also tune in to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook or follow me. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye.